Ephesians 5, verse 21. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his, of his body, the church. And the church submits to Christ, so you wives should sh submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this mean, uh, means love your, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave us life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's, God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a, a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> I think there's very few texts that make me as nervous as this text. Um, historically, I've preached it and people have left the church. Um, true story. Um, and, and our goal today is not to upset people, but to go, okay, God, you are king of our lives. You are king of, whether we're just saying, you're king of me, king of our family. What does it look like for us to surrender to your design, your way for our lives, to walk in honor and glory for your name's sake? Um, and, we, and we reread this text today. It, it, we can quickly take a step back and we hate the word submit. We'll unpack that eventually this morning. But to just say, Lord, we want to submit to who you are first and foremost, and then what you have for us. But the overarching context of today's message isn't actually about marriage. Um, we just read a snippet. When we take it out of context, we read, okay, it's marriage, and then he's going to speak about parenting, and then he's going to speak about employees and employees. But from last week, we ended off with be filled but with the Spirit. Right? That's what Paul said last week. He said, as believers, we'll be to be filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, loved through the Spirit to the people around us. And then he says, because you are Spirit-filled, if you follow the context of the text, it says, because you are Spirit-filled, it's going to impact how you interact with your spouse. It's going to interact how you are as a wife and how you are as a husband. It's going to interact or, in, or impact how you act as a parent, how you act as a child. Impact how you act as an employee and an employer. So everything we're going to be looking at today, so it doesn't matter if you're married or not this morning, we're going to look through the lens of using this as our base and going, okay, what does it mean for me to be spirit-filled, to live in the culture we live in? What does it mean for me to pursue Christ over and above what I want or how I'm feeling in that moment that He would be glorified? And we're going to unpack a little bit this morning a brief overview of uh, the woman, or women's roles within the Bible, within the church, within the homes, and then the responsibility of men to love well, to sacrifice well for their wives. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Let me open in prayer because we need the Lord this morning. <sighs> Lord, we just acknowledge we need you, Lord. We thank you for your scripture that is given to us to guide us into uni unity with you, Lord. So we surrender any preconceived perceptions we have this morning, Lord, any um, past hurts and pains or, or whatever it is, Lord, we want to lay it down at the foot of the cross this morning, Lord. We want to invite the Spirit in to open our hearts, open our ears to hear what it is you have for us, Lord. To hear that you are guiding us in equality, in worth, in dignity, in purpose, Lord. So we just thank you for that this morning, Lord. Lord, we truly do invite you. We know it can be, in, in, in today's climate, this can be such a contentious subject, Lord. Even within the church, there's so much divide around these issues, Lord. We want to surrender it to you, Lord. Lord, may your Spirit speak the words we need to hear this morning, Lord. To guide and direct us that we would glorify your name in the midst of the culture and the, the, this, the world that we live, Lord. That your name is worthy of it all. Thank you, Jesus. 
Amen. And, and, and the challenge, the question as we were worshiping, singing that song, or oh, Jesus, um, King of me, King of my family, is there anything in your life you had not, have not had to struggle in surrendering to God? Right, so before we even get to the word submit, what we see is submitting to who God is, His ways is universal. It's, the, it's, it's where it's our disposition as believers. We are continually saying this anger I'm feeling, this bitterness, this frustration, this desire is not of God. I'm laying it down time and time again. So even when we get to text now with women and men in different roles and responsibilities, the disposition of a spiritual believer is to continually say, Lord, your will, not my will. Am I right or wrong? We're with us. So keep that as the overarching theme. That's what Paul's trying to get to. That is a design for us that God wants us to walk in that produces joy. And, and yeah, Chuck Swindle says of this text, it should come with a big sign that says, beware dragons dwell here. <laughs> because we need to approach it gently. We need to try approach it sensitively because people have been abused because of this text. People have been hurt and betrayed because of this text. Historically, the church has landed on the wrong side of this text time and time again when they silenced the abused and they empower the abusers because that is what it means to be a godly man. And, and, and we're going to speak about that this morning and call out abuse where the church has wrongly enforced um, the silence of women at their own well or own health and, and well-being. And, and like I've said, in today's society, gender roles is a huge discussion that leads to many leaving churches, many fights within. And in the Bible, we get close-handed issues. That's the, that's the, the personhood of Christ, the, the, the goodness of Christ, the Trinity, the full life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Those are close-handed issues. Universally, every church and believer believes those things. And that's why the deconstructive faith movement that we've been looking at the last couple of weeks or just alluding to, those go after core doctrinal beliefs. That's why it's so dangerous within the church. But then you get open-handed issues um, within the church, whether that would be tongues or or the role of women within the church, or whatever those are. Those are areas in which we, we need to be very charitable and gracious when we discuss them. It means that we can disagree completely on those issues, but for, the, for Christ's namesake, for the unity of believers, we still work together and walk together as one. I have friends that are radically different on, on today's teaching, um, but we're still friends. We still wrestle through the text. We, we're people of the Word, so we go to the Word, and we try to say, God, what is it that you're guiding and directing us from? And that's why today is way more of a teaching sermon than a preaching sermon, but there will be preaching interlaced with it because I'm more of a preacher than a teacher. Um, but, but we want to go, Lord, what does it mean for us as a church to surrender to your Word? And before we get into it, I want to say, I don't believe today is a salvation issue. So if you disagree with me on today's text, it's not a salvation issue. I don't believe it's a false teaching issue. I believe it's interpretation issue. So if anything I say today doesn't sit well with you, it upsets you, it makes you want to leave the church, please come speak to me. I will even pay for the coffee. We, <laughs> we, we can just chat and sit down and work through this text together. And, and so... And within those open-handed issues, there's distinctives that make up a church. So what are one of the key distinctives of Jeffreys Bay Baptist Church that makes us us? And I, and I borrowed a, a graph from the village church. There it is, um, who borrowed it from another church. So churches just like to borrow things. But we see there's, there's four spheres um, within our interpretation of Scripture of what it means of women's roles within the church, women's roles within the household, and how we function by design. Also within those things, the role of men. So I'm not picking a woman this morning. It's the role of men also within the church, within the homes, which will probably land on more than, than the woman. I'm just trying to be sensitive. Of, and that's why I probably I'm overcompensating by speaking to the woman first. <laughs> and, and so we see within that you get a biblical framework for all of those things. But on the extreme ends, it's always where abuse and hurt comes from. Fez, feminism at, at its extreme end rejects any male headship authority. Um, they want nothing to do with men in power, men in authority, men in any headship position. And on the extreme other end of that, which is unbiblical, abusive, but is, and has sadly been the historical position of most churches throughout history, um, is the patriarchy. That men are the head, they know everything, they do everything. Women are to may, remain silent, remain in the kitchen, to be seen, not heard, right? We all know that. Martin Luther, the, the, one of the church finders, there's a quote of him saying that women are made for, they've got smaller hips to be stay at home and maneuver easily at home and clean and cook and remain quiet. 
That's our church forefathers, right? No one, and that's the quotes we see throughout history that the church has not been right on these things when we go to the extreme end of patriarchy. Right, then you get elite, these are big broad strokes here. Um, egalitarianism, believe men and women are created equal and can have equal roles within marriage and the church body. Which means there are no unique roles that God has created for man and woman. Everyone just can do anything. Right, specifically speaking about the role within the home and the role within the church. The Bible has nothing to say about women in powers of business and performance and, and, cult, and, and culture. Very important. Strictly speaking today, we're speaking about the role of women that they play within the household and the role essentially that they play within the church. Very important. Patriarchy would have us believe that women should not be presidents or CEOs or anything like that. We don't get that from Scripture at all. There's no Scripture, even complementarianism where we stand. It has more to do with what is the role of men and women within the church. That we believe they are created equal but, and within marriage and the church body they have a different role. Everything we see from the Trinity, everyone is created equal, but there's a unique role that God has for us, and that creates a unity and a blessing that flows from that. Equal in value, um, but, but different in function. And, and I'll preference this again by saying that does not equal cleaner, cook, stay at home. We don't get that from Scripture. So much of our understanding of complementarianism or our comp or understanding of women's roles and husband's roles comes from culture and tradition and patriarchy and not from Scripture. It's very important that we see this this morning. We're still going to get to those roles of submitting to the husband as head and the husband loving his wife because that is the biblical role we believe God has called us to. Equal but different within context, within culture. But as a church, that's where we, we land. We're complementarianism. We believe that man and woman are created equal. It does not mean men are cleverer. Amen. <laughs> um, and, and, and I love that, that in the garden where, where, where God goes to Adam and says, let's create you a helper. The deficiency wasn't from the woman. The deficiency was on the man's side that he needed a helper. It's very humbling to us that we see that the position and the job of helper isn't an inferior one. It's actually a superior one in helping and assisting man. Amen. You women should like that one. <laughs> Men are like, no, hey, this guy doesn't, I think we should find another church. Um, it just gets worse for you from, yeah, men. <laughs> but, but that's where we are. That's what we believe as a church. It's historically what we believe. It's my own personal conviction when I wrestle through Scripture and I fight with Scripture and I, and I speak to people that we are complementarians. We believe God created us equal, um, unique, but with unique roles. That when we function in those roles, the, the, the kingdom thrives. So let's start by verse 4, verse 21. It says this, And further submit one another out of reverence for Christ. So that is what Paul is saying. Spirit-filled living is driven firstly by reverence for Christ. We will not have spirit-filled marriages, spirit-filled workplaces, or parenting if we do not have a right perspective of who Christ is. That He is King. His ways over my ways. His guiding over my guiding. His design over, over, over mine. Right? There's an equal submission to, all, to Christ in all. Man and woman submit to Christ. That's what we see in Scripture time and time again. And, and, and we will not function or thrive in our marriages until we get that right. And say, okay, who does God reveal himself to be? As we've been looking the last couple of weeks and our midweeks Bible studies, God tells us who he is through Scripture, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, through his word, through his guiding, and not who we say he is. A lot of our issues and frustrations with the Bible, with God, with church is because we put onto the church who they should be rather than letting God declare who we are, if you're following. So, so much of that's important. We will not understand until we submit to who God is. There is a submitting to design and function based on who God is and what requires of Him. Right? And, and there's a powerful quote from Sam Storms that, that kind of sums this idea of, of complementarianism up for us. Both men and women are, create, are together created in the divine image and are therefore equal before God as persons, possessing the same moral dignity and value and have equal access to God through faith in Christ, which means women don't need men to enter into the presence of God. Amen. Men don't need God. We have equal access to Him. Men and women are together the recipients of spiritual gifts designed to equip and empower them for ministry in the local church and beyond. 
Therefore, women are to be encouraged, equipped, and empowered to utilize their gifting in ministry, in service to the body of Christ, and through teachings in ways that are consistent with the Word of God. And the principle of male headship should not be confused with, nor given any hint of domineering control. Rather, it is to be loving, tender, nurturing care of a godly man who in himself and is under the kind and gentle authority of Jesus Christ. Right, so, so we, it's kind of the surrender. Okay, God, we need you to submit. Wives, we need Jesus or, or women or wives specifically. We need God in our lives to be head of our lives, to be king before we will submit to the position of, of authority that he's given a husband in our lives. And husbands, we need Jesus to help us love our wives for who they are and where they're at in their journey. Amen. Just me. My wife's in Sunday school. So, but she, yeah, I need Jesus. We all need Jesus. And, and, and it's that idea. So verse 22, For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. At the church, the Mr. Christ, so your wives should submit to your husbands in everything. And he has the challenge. Who likes the word submission? We hate it, right? And the Bible doesn't seem to have a problem with it. We do because of cultural abuse or context that we find ourselves in. Submit is almost forced upon you. You will submit to my will, right? When you're disciplining your children, they will be obedient. But have you ever made your children's internal um, disposition surrender to you? No, you can make their outside surrender, but you cannot make the inside surrender. There needs to be a willful submission of the will before that person. Same way in marriage, that no matter how much physical, I'm not condoning, but physical abuse cannot lead to an internal surrender. And Paul is writing and Jesus is pleading that we would willfully surrender to the position that, are, that he's given our husbands to lead and direct and take responsibility for us before him. Right, and, and that's the thing. There's negative connotations, and, and the patriarchy throughout history um, has done serious damage, has abused the position that God has given them time and time again. There are very few that are unscathed by abusive headship and, and a misrepresentation of um, who God or those God has placed in charge. And Satan loves to take what God has designed for good and push it to the extremes of decay and destruction time and time again. And I remember doing a friend's wedding where he was like, please, my, my best friend's wedding at the time, and he was like, you could please do our wedding, just don't use the word submit. <laughs> like at all, you're not allowed to. And he gave me all these Christian words that were taboo that I wasn't allowed to say. Um, I was like, okay, cool, I'll figure out something else. Um, surrender. <laughs> but but we, we wrestle through, right? Because we hate the word, but biblically it doesn't mean what it means today. And, and throughout Scripture, all believers are called to submit to God. So we hate the word submit to your husbands, but Scripture is quite clear, submit to God. And that's why Paul's saying, look, ladies, you may have a heart issue. If you're struggling to submit to your husband, and in that everything isn't everything, if it's unbiblical, against the law, abusive, it's nonsense, call the elders or the police and get them involved. So it's not this kind of your husband has right over your body, it's your husband has right to lead you in the things of God, 100%. But, but it's, a, it's a heart issue saying, well, if you can't respect your husband or submit to your husband in godly matters, how can you res submit ultimately to God? Husbands, if we struggle to love our wives, how on earth are we going to love God? If we struggle to lay down our life that we would serve and love and sacrifice our wives for her well-being, we're going to struggle to do that with God. Marriage is seen as a, as, a, a, as, a, as a tangible covenantal promise of how we are with God. And I guarantee you those things will play out. When we struggle to love well, we'll struggle to walk in obedience to God. When we struggle to surrender to the position of the, the husband in the household, we will struggle to surrender to who God is in our lives. When he calls us to lay down and surrender to him. But the word surrender or the word submission comes from a military term um, biblically. So they would have understood being at war and all these things. And it simply means that you willfully respect the rank above you. It means you say, okay, there's a husband or the sergeant, I don't know the ranks of the, the, the army, but the person above you, they're in a higher rank. It doesn't mean they're clever. It doesn't mean that anything, it just means they're in a higher rank. And I will willfully surrender and say, okay, I will honor that position because of where you are. 
And I love that God designs positions and different things based on the, the, his design and not on the person, which is vitally important. It's why even in surrendering to a husband as headship, you respect the position the same way God says we respect the government, we respect those in authority, we respect those things because it deals with our heart. Spiritual life deals with heart. It's that simple. How is our heart in those things? And it's aligning with those things. And, and, and we see it all the time. And an individual will submit to the rank above them. It's the same as um, in that, then if your soldiers go and mess around, the sergeant, whoever's in charge of that body of individuals is responsible before the higher authority. It's the same way we see in the family of God. And this should shake us and scare us a little as men is that we stand before God responsible for our household's well-being, the spiritual climate of our household, the spiritual climate of our wife, not wife's wife, um, is our responsibility before God. There comes with it ex, ex, you know, this extreme responsibility and privilege to be able to lead and love like God would in that household. It's not about using your power in, in abuse as it has been historically misused. It's about surrendering and saying, God, use me that they would know your hand in marriage. Right? God comes to back in Genesis. Eve eats the fruit, everything falls apart. Adam's right there choosing to worship the woman instead of God. And, and we continue that in our culture. We worship woman before we even think of God. And after all this falls apart, God comes and walks in and, and he finds Adam. He doesn't go to Eve. And what does he ask of Adam? He said, what have you done? Not tell me what's wrong with your wife. Not tell me why it's difficult to lead. Not tell me X, Y, Z of what's going on around you. He says, you are responsible. You carry uh, the mandated responsibility as head. It's the same responsibility as the eldership of the church carries over this body. They carry a responsibility for the spiritual climate of all of you. They're not responsible for your sin. So you, as a wife, can sin. A husband, uh, she's still responsible for her sin. But her husband carries with it the responsibility of it. That's what we see from this text. And, and, and we see Christian men carry with them responsibility of their households, and, and that really should shake us men. It should really shake us to our knees in surrender. This is, we need Jesus. And that's what Paul's getting at you. Ultimately, we all submit to God in his ways. And, and God values the family unit, and we see culturally, or where men go, the family goes, and ultimately culture goes. We see that with the breakdown of men being um, men or, or husbands and leaders and loving well and sacrificing well. And when I say men being men, I don't mean that they're burly, overgrown, um, I need to shave. Um, but not this like rugged, I'm going to oh, beat up a, a horse and eat it. Or you don't eat horses, but whatever animal. But so often that's our persona of godly men, right? That they rugged, rough, but that's not what Scripture is saying. It's that they're gentle, caring, and intuitive to the needs of the household. And we have lost that as men because we've kind of got caught up on the, there's nothing wrong with being rugged or whatever it is, but there needs to be this kind of, Lord, teach me to love well, right? Because historically the patriarchy believes to be a good father, all you have to do is what? Provide, right? 100%. We all grew up, or the majority of us grew up in an era where the only responsibility of the father was to provide money and food. And that is not found in Scripture, Right? There's no scripture that says go work your life so that you can provide food. It says provide nurture, care, love, tenderness, those things which we have forsaken in the name of patriarchy instead of surrendering to God and saying this is how I love well. And you know, within the original culture, that's why this wasn't so controversial in the original text. Original culture, women had no rights. They were seen as possessions that the husband could do and use and say what he wanted, do what he wanted, divorce, throw away, kill, whatever it was in the, text, in the, in the context. That Paul's writing to the husbands is so much more severe to be surrendering and loving and kind and caring. And, and the woman would have understood that there was this idea, okay, well, I have to respect him because of the power and position he has. But Paul comes and says he wants women to have a willful surrender to their husbands. Not out of fear of death or divorce or anything else, but out of a reverence or for who Christ is that would lead me to surrender. Spiritful living is living as Christ has called us to in every area of our lives to say, Lord, your way over my way. Your leading over my leading. Right? And God tells us through our scripture, he tells us to honor leaders, submit to government. I've said that. 
And the command against the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church is radical. And, and I think it's, it's really good for us to wrestle through. We, we, we don't have time this morning to wrestle through and go through. But saying as a submissive, submissive wife is not submitting in things that are ungodly or abusive or horrible or slanderous. It doesn't mean historically what we think is they, they must be, the husband must be the breadwinner or, or the wife must change diapers or make meals. And that's so often how we think. That's not what it means. But it means that there's a supportive, encouraging, loving role of a wife to encourage and respect the husband, irrespective of how well he's doing on that day. Right? And it's not a pattern of abuse that I'm, I'm talking about. Some husbands are abusive, and that's plain wrong, and there's no scripture that's going to justify abusive behavior. But sometimes it's the wife's role is to respect and, lo- uh, and honor the husband, irrespective of how he's doing that day. In the same way, the husband is called to love the wife, irrespective of how she's doing on that day. Right, that's why, and, and, and it's so important that we get those tensions. There's a role that we honor and love and support and commit to that carries us through marriage, carries us through life because it is by God's design and not by how we wake up feeling on that day. And, and that's why husbands say, you will, you know, it says, Christian men to love the position of wife irrespective of the wife. Verse 25, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. And some husbands respond, right? I'll love my wife like Christ loves the church as soon as she starts to submit herself to me. Men, I love conditional stuff, right? <laughs> well, when she gets it right, then maybe I'll try. Or wives are like, well, my husband never gets it right, so how can I honor and respect that? And so often we're waiting for the other person to be who God's called them to be while ignoring who he's called us to be. And, and here's the thing. It's not how Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church that was not submissive to him. Christ died for a church that was in rebellion against him. Again, I'm not advocating any abuse here. Either side. To suggest God approves abuse by design is ludicrous and misses the Father's heart. It is vitally important. And you will know every chance I get, we preach against abuse. Any form of subtle abuse, emotional, physical, um, whatever it is, we, it, is, it breaks the Father's heart. We need to understand that we put ourselves against God when we put ourselves against His creation. It's that simple. This week, um, we got a message from Abby's school just a, a, on the school group that said a, uh, uh, some grade fours had been bullied by grade sevens. Abby's in grade four. Um, and, and it took everything in me not to drive to the school to make sure that Abby wasn't the one being bullied. She wouldn't have been the bully, but to make sure she wasn't bullied. But the, the message said parents had been contacted. We hadn't been contacted. So I figured it wasn't her. So, um, but, but that's the father's heart. We need to understand this this morning. We, as men and women, need to feel the weight of this. When we are abusive against His creation, against His beauties, against His bride, against His children, we are putting ourselves against God. It doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are, how, what arrogant you are, you are putting yourself against the Creator of the universe, and He will not tolerate you misusing and, mis- and abusing His children. It is vitally important that we get this understanding. That is the Father's heart. That's the context of this scripture that He wants His children loved and treated well and guarded well and respected well. It's not trying to control or manipulate or ruin your life. He's saying, I have a design and a purpose for you that is found in that I gave my full life, death, and resurrection that you would walk in what I have for you. He goes after the heart through the working of the Holy Spirit. To bring about changed lives and culture. And he does it when speaking about marriage, when speaking about slavery, about workers. Time and time again, Paul doesn't just obliterate what's going on. He says, within culture, you will be a change agent. Go look how he speaks about slavery, about parenting, about workplace, about marriage. He says, within those things, I need you to be the salt and the light. I need you to shine the glory of Christ, the worth of Christ, that others would come to know me. And at the, you know, he is constantly pointing us to spiritual life, which is radically different. We said it last week. We cannot be mediocre Christians in today's culture. We have to be all out for Christ, sold out for Christ, to be the salt and the light within marriage, within parenting, within um, work, every aspect of our lives to shine His glory. Because there's worth in everything He calls us to. And at the heart of being a Christian is service. In imitating God, that's how Ephesians 5 starts, is imitate God in all that you do by being spirit-filled, 
It's to shine His love and respect. Being Christian is the opposite of demanding rights or positions or abusing our authority. It's that, that simple. Throughout Scripture, against men and against women, there are things we cannot do. There are things you cannot do that your heart wants to do, if you want to be honest this morning. And, and, and that's where Paul draws limits, both on male and female, some within the church, some within the, the, the marriage, some within society, some within the workplace. Time and time again, there's limits. And limits are true for all believers. Right? There's equality across the board. It's true for all believers. We are called to submit areas of our lives to God where we, find, where we would find true identity perceived or, or where we find identity perceived worth. We lay it all down so we can truly know the peace and the love and the goodness of God. Right? We must understand that human value is not dependent on what you can and cannot do. This is vastly important. Human value is not dependent on what you can and cannot do. Otherwise, so much of my self-worth is found in what I do, how much I make, how well everyone's doing, all of these things. If human worth is dependent on function, then the handicapped, the ill, the unborn would have no worth whatsoever. And we see this as a great push of culture. Right, it's why we, we, we're happy to see where, where freedom of choice over sanctity of life, sanctity of life the innocent suffer. Rather, by God's grace, we have been freed from thinking of ourselves on the basis of birth, status, wealth, or accomplishments. We are seen as sons and daughters of the Most High God for, pla- for a purpose to, to live it out. And, so, and, and I love that. Something is only worth as much as someone is willing to pay. Right? I, some of my favorite things to, to do is if you check Gumtree or Facebook Marketplace, and there's things that are priced for like, so, like 50,000 rand for a side table because it's from my great grand or whatever it is, right? You cannot put a price on emotion, right? You cannot put a price on emotion. Things are only worth as much as someone is willing to pay. And here's the thing, how much are you worth? We look to the cross and say, how much was Christ willing to pay? And, and that's the thing we've got to focus on this morning is Christ has a plan and a purpose and a worth over you that he did not deem his life or equality with God, something to hold on to, but emptied himself to the, to, in the very form of a servant all the way to the cross. How much are you worth? Don't look in the mirror. Don't look at your bank balance. Don't look at, at the things going on around you. Look to the cross. Look to the face of Jesus, the blood that drips down his face, and he says, you are worthy of it all. And, and, and Paul has given us this, this spirit-filled living within the context of marriage for, to to work against our inward hearts the brokenness of the fall that we see in genesis that we would rule over and destroy and abuse women and and women would would attack and fight back against men it's from the fall we see it paul is saying you have worth and you have value to shine the goodness of god says husbands and wives are called to submit to their lives uh, or to live out their lives in the home environment As Jesus is our example, wives are to submit to their husbands as expression, as a submission to Christ. And Jesus, the Lord, Lord, is the basis, motivation, and qualification for submission. Husbands are to love their wives by sacrificially serving them just as Christ loved them and served the church, giving up his own life for her. That is spiritual living when we commit to walk empowered by the spirit of God's design as we love those he places in our lives. And again, as the band comes up, I know I've said a lot this morning. Some will think I'm being far too liberal in what I've preached. Others will think I'm being far too narrow-minded and conservative. Please speak to me. If anything I've said today really upset you, really confused you, come speak to me. I know I was uh, up and down a bit today all over with, with the topic. But truly that we would just surrender to say God loves us. God sees us. God wants to guide and direct us for His purpose. And we would just lay it down in all things. And that's why irrespective of where you're at this morning, if you're married, single, divorced, widowed, whatever it is, God has a plan and a purpose for you. He has a worth for you, finding who the price He's paid for you. That, 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 that no one would argue that the value of the blood is worthless. So how much more does Christ value us that He was willing to lay down His life for us? Let me pray. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we know um, you know, it's sometimes tough to wrestle through biblical viewpoints, biblical text in light of culture, in light of our own hearts and, uh, and pain and understanding, Lord. 
So we surrender it this morning, Lord. We know there's a, a lot said, um, yeah, a bit all over the show, Lord, but we surrender it to you, Lord. And as we prayed right in the beginning, what needed to be heard by the individuals would be heard through the working of your Spirit, Lord. That your word would not return back void, Lord. We pray, Lord, for every wife that is present here, that you would work in her heart, that she would walk in obedience to you and submit in reverence or first and foremost to you and respect her husband, Lord. Respect him out of reverence to you, Lord. Again, not in abuse or anything like that, but just to honor, irrespective of how they're doing that day, there would be a level of respect, Lord. In the same way, Lord, we... The husbands here would love their wives sacrificially to lay it down time and time again, irrespective of how she's doing that day, Lord. You would teach us to love. And as we both come, as marriages come to, to the party there, Lord, in sacrificial love and, 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 um, and, and respect, Lord, your name would be glorified, Lord. Marriages would thrive, Lord. And ultimately, Lord, we thank you that you love us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have ordained things as a means of protection and love and thriving, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your scripture teaches that we are siblings, Lord, not subordinates. So that we would honor our, our, our brothers and sisters in the faith, Lord. Who would stand firm for our brothers and sisters in the faith. Lord, for those that have through, through this scripture, through um, patriarchy, Lord, been abused, been made to feel worth than, made to feel that they have no value within church, within Christian living, Lord. We pray for a, a restoration, Lord. We pray for a, a, an igno a, a reigniting of the gifting and the passions that you've placed on, on, on those people here this morning, Lord. We pray for those, Lord, that have maybe grown up in that time of patriarchy where they missed the mark, Lord. They sinned against their family. They sinned against you, ultimately, Lord. That right now, Lord, the enemy wouldn't come with condemnation, Lord, but the Holy Spirit would come with conviction. And we would repent of our sins, Lord. We repent where we have treated women as commodities, Lord. Where we have treated our wives as slaves. Where we have not honored you, Lord. Where we have not served and loved as Christ would, Lord. And Lord, that we, that today wouldn't just be a day of healing and repentance, Lord. It would be a day of restoration, Lord. It would be a day where, where we say, Lord, I'm going to walk in what it is you have for me, for my marriage, for my life, for, my, for, my, for, my, for where we're at today, Lord. So we surrender it to you now, Lord. As we sing, we just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are at work in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.